There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. Hey, about a decade ago, I was very privileged when I was traveling down in Latin America doing some leadership training to meet an individual that at the time I did not know, but I've been very, very grateful that he has become a very dear friend, an encouragement, a motivation for me. His name is Jeff Phillips. Jeff and his entire family are leading a missional movement of church planning in different places in Latin America. They're involved in leadership teaching and training of young people, and they've also been involved in mobilizing Latinas to go to the world. Jeff, I'm going to invite you to come on up, and would you please uh, give Jeff a welcome this morning as he comes and speaks to us. Thank you so much. It's great to be back here at Living Word. I'm just thrilled to be able to share once again, uh, especially in a season that's so important about missions, about being missional people as well. And so uh, the message that I, that I bring today is the, how do individuals, how do churches become missional people in, in, in a country where sometimes we can get comfortable? And so as I began to think about this and as, as Pastor Brian challenged me about the, this message, I began to think of what happened in my life because I was born in Portland, Oregon and never considered world missions for, for, many, time, for many years. I went to Chile for a two-year commitment. I've been there 42 years now. <laughs> and from... From Chile, our four children were born there. We went into a, the Santiago area initially. This is six million people in this area, an incredibly large, large area. And then we were taken into another area, which was a bedroom community called Maipu, which at the time we got there was 30,000 people. It is now close to one million people. And seven churches were planted there. And so as we began to work in these areas, the Lord opened doors to go all the way up to Ecuador. And we believe so much in invitations. And that invitation took us into this small town, which was called San Borondon. And it was just a wild, wild west type of situation that we're in. From there, we went in down farther south to Tacna, Peru, which is on the right on the border with Chile. It has the driest desert in the world. It has not rained for 100 years in this area, and so it's not your favorite vacation spot. <laughs> so I thought I'd figured out God. Okay, we're just going to plant churches in every one of the countries in Latin America. The next thing I find out is I have left Latin America. <laughs> and we found ourselves in Iraq, another wonderful vacation spot. <laughs> and went to what was called Sulaymaniyah, which is a city of 1,300,000 people. What's, what are all these, thing, these countries have in common? When we got there, Chile, there was a dictator, Pinochet. When we went to Ecuador, it was the Wild West. When we went to Tacna, Peru, it was the Shining Path terrorist group. When we got here, it was the year of the war in 2003. So we just get to go to some of the greatest places in the world. <laughs> so privileged. Here's the first test for Living Word. How many of you have this? Raise your hands, please. Okay. Most of you have passed the test. Very good. Tomorrow, those of you are, who are behind need to get your passport. Because it talks about it, what we're involved in, what God wants to do in our lives, and what we are called to. Many people say, we need to just get out of our comfort zone. There, there's nothing wrong with that statement. Actually, I like that statement initially, but we've transitioned and, and are using a new term that is called expand your comfort zone. Because sometimes your, your comfort zone is so limited. It might even be right inside this building. 
This is my comfort zone. But I had, I was with, uh, with Pastor John and Pastor Brian uh, this week, the first few days, and they were talking about the incredible opportunities that Living Word has outside of just the local church. You're, they're involved in all kinds of local ministries. I would love to encourage you to expand your comfort zone, at least in your city. I've come to the place now, I've been in over 40 countries, and I just move in comfort. I've fallen in love with so many cultures, I've fallen in love with so many people, and it's just turned out to be an incredible experience as we continue to move on in those ways. One of the things that took place in my life was in Portland, Oregon. And the sex industry became very, very large in that city. And our youth pastor decided to take the youth group to downtown Portland, Oregon, and pray in front of the largest porn shop. Now, you had to have parental permission. I'm not quite sure what I told my parents, but I got permission. Half of the youth group did not get permission. And so they stayed at our church and they prayed for the people that went there. And so they started this list and listed all the people that were downtown and gave 15 minute segments of prayer. And so we got down there and we're beginning to pray and it was on the corner. And so the the youth were on both sides. It was amazing. People, guys, mostly, only men would be walking up to the porn shop. They'd look up. And they just walked away. Not a single person walked in to that porn shop that day. But we were called also to testify. And so as I was watching, this, this guy came down the street and I said to him, God loves you. And he was a Native American, really big. And he walked up and he goes, how do you know? I said, well, the Bible says. He said, show me. Now, I'd only been a Christian six months, and I went, I'm, I'm going to go get somebody. <laughs> and he grabbed me and whipped me around. He said, you show me. Well, I did know John 3.16. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he looked at me, and he goes, not bad. <laughs> and he starts off, and to this day, I don't know what I said to him. It, I'm sure it wasn't an insult, and he turned on me. And he came towards me and I went, this guy's going to kill me. And so I started back and I, got, I had nowhere to go and I'm looking at all the other youth and they're in the twilight zone. They're nowhere around and they don't see me. And so I'm, I'm just going, what, you know, what do I do? And he comes up and he hits me with his chest and knocks me against the wall. And so I kind of get up again and he starts towards me again and I go, God, this is not fair. I've only been a Christian six months. Come on, kill one of these other guys that have been around here forever. And nobody saw anything. Again, I'm just looking. What do I do? What do I do? And I went, okay, I'm done. Get ready. I'm coming. And he gets right in my face. And all of a sudden he goes. And he walks away. And I kind of sink down to the floor. And then everybody wakes up. Jeff, what are you, what's the matter? What are you doing down there? And I go, oh, what's the matter? Where were you when I almost got killed? <laughs> but we continued testifying that. And then we went back to the church. And we started sharing our testimonies. And obviously everybody goes, Jeff, talk about what happened. And so I talk, started talking about it. And they said, Jeff, do you remember when that was? And I go, like, I'm going to forget. It was at 4.15. And all the prayer group looked at each other and they lifted up the paper and at 4.15 they started praying for me. And I began to understand about God's love and God's protection as we walk in obedience. And one of my favorite movies is What About Bob? I just love that movie. And, you know, baby steps to the elevator. That's kind of what our life is like as we begin to walk in obedience, as we get into and make a comfort zone larger and larger in in our lives. We become world Christians by becoming local Christians first. 
Pray about a ministry here. Pray about how you can serve your community, even watching, changing oil in a car, washing cars. Just, but there's multiple things that I've heard about that just seem so, so incredible. What is the most frequently repeated command in the Bible? Do not fear. Over 300 times that command is given in the Bible. Why? Because fear paralyzes us. And our enemy knows that. He knows how to control the church. He knows how to control individual lives through fear. And so that's why God is continually and always encouraging us to abandon the fear, to walk in trust. Some of the worship songs today, just beautiful declarations of how we are to walk in faith and and just be bathed in the love of our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with, your right, with my righteous right hand, the right hand of Yahweh. The right hand of the Father is a powerful, powerful hand and his righteousness will cover us and protect us all of the days of our lives. Here's the next test. How many of you have a check for $100,000 to be, make missions possible in your lives? Raise your hands, please. Good. That's the last thing you need when it comes to faith and obedience. It's the last thing. When we were in Bible college, my wife and I, we graduated, and we didn't have a lot of contacts. And... So we sent out letters to all these churches and we were in San Jose, California and we got a, a response from Ashland, Oregon, which is quite a drive, you know, it's uh, all the way up there. And so they said, yeah, come and uh, we will take up an offering for you. And so we drove up the day before because we wanted to get there early. They didn't offer a place to stay, so we rented this raunchy motel room. Uh, and as we were getting out, I was just in shorts and a tank top. And so there was another guy going into the, the motel room next to us. And he said, oh, have you just been at the beach? And I said, no, we drove up from San Jose, California, and I'm going to be preaching at a church tomorrow, and we're going to be missionaries in Chile. And he went, Ooh, and t- turned around and walked in and closed the door. And I went, mm, that's not what I was expecting. So the next day we go to the church nice and early and I knock on the pastor's door and he opens the door and I said, hi, I'm, we're Jeff and Kathy Phillips and we're here to speak. And he said, didn't you get the letter? I said, yeah, that's why we're here. No, the letter not to come. I went, what? We, we drove all the way from San Jose, California. I'm sorry. And he turned around and closed the door. And I looked at Kathy and I said, Kathy, I was expecting an offering. We don't have a dime. We can pay our bill at the hotel and we don't have gas money. We'll run out of gas. So we go back and pay the bill at the motel. And we're going out to the car and I'm putting the stuff in the trunk and the same guy that I met the day before goes, so, taking off? And I go, yeah, yeah, we are. And he walks up and he goes, good luck. And he walks away and I look down and there's enough money for us to get back to Santiago. And I go, I get this. This is the way the Father takes care of people that walk in obedience. Now, I've tried to tell him, I would really like it a little in advance. It would really be lovely. (laughs) He has convinced me that I don't need it in advance. And so I've just learned to love and walk in obedience our entire, entire life. And God has been faithful. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. One of the interesting things as you begin to walk in your love, in the love of Yahweh, in the love of Jesus, just 
there's just such a peace that passes all understanding. But when I go into the Islamic world, there's such fear. They believe in a day of judgment where all of their acts will be put in a balance. And if they don't have enough good works, they will be thrown into a lake of fire for eternity. The concept of eternal love of a good, good father just doesn't exist. So it just breaks my heart because as we move in his love, it just casts away all the fears that each and every one of us deals with. Look what Empty Wright says. Let's make no mistake about it. Until you learn to live without fear, you won't find it easy to follow Jesus. Because Jesus always wants to take us one step farther. Jesus always wants to encourage us to, to go one step farther in our relationship, in our obedience with him. The last time I spoke here, I, I shared some of my testimony and a, and a lovely lady come, came up to me and said, Jeff, you are so brave. And, and I thanked her, actually. I said, you know, thank you. And as I, as I walked away, I went, you know, I really don't want to be known as brave. There are a lot of brave people that just get killed. Extreme sports, those people are brave. <laughs> kind of stupid, too, you know? <laughs> so that's not the, what I desire in my life. I truly desire two words, faithful and obedient. These are the, what brings confidence to go forward and go into Iraq and all different places that we have gone throughout our life. The safest place in the world is in God's will. I would rather be in Baghdad, Iraq, in God's will than in York, Pennsylvania, outside of his will. I know what happens in downtown York. That's a scary place. Baghdad is a lot scarier though. But when you're in his will, there's an incredible amount of safety and goodness. And I truly believe our days are numbered by God. So if I have to choose how I want to go, I'd rather go out in a firebomb in Baghdad than to have one of you come up and ask Pastor Brian, whatever happened to Jeff? Well, you know, his days were numbered. He didn't go to Baghdad. He slipped in the tub and we lost him. <laughs> really? I much prefer to walk in obedience, walk in faith and see what our Father has for each and every one of us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he, Pastor Brian uses him many times, but I think this is incredible. He says, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than courageously and actively doing God's will. Those of you, of you who know Bonhoeffer, he was a pastor. He was a spy during Hitler's time, he died as a martyr, but he un understood, and, and I'm not against being a holy, holy people, but on the other hand, I have, I've studied holiness movements that had, were passionate about things and all, all of a sudden began ingrown, ingrown and began concerned about issues that had nothing to do with a lost world and doing God's will as well in this world to 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 see what he desires for our lives. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. When he defined himself the Savior of the world, he said, I came to seek that which was lost. To restore the relationship that was broken through sin, he came back and he established a relationship and goodness through his own life. Soon we'll celebrate that sacrifice and we'll celebrate his resurrection from the dead. And that is why he came in. And some of his precious stories that he has. He left the 99 to seek that one lost sheep. That woman who lost one coin, she tore the house apart 
to find that one last coin that was missing. And when she found it, called in all the neighbors and they rejoiced over the situation. And one of the most beautiful, beautiful stories, the prodigal son. There's a song that touched my heart deeply many years ago. And the, and the chorus says, the only time I saw God run is when he ran to me, held me in his arms, held my head to his chest and said, my son's come home again. This is the heart of the father. This is the heart of our Lord who rejoices in taking people like me who was destroyed through drugs and raising them up to be used for his service and for his glory and to walk in obedience. I have felt Yahweh's pleasure in moments of crisis of the faith in other countries more than any other place in the world. I have literally, those of you who have time in the church remember Experiencing God, a great book, a great start to, to, to seeking out and walking in obedience. And it comes to moments of crisis of faith. Those crises of faith for me is when I've had teams in Iraq, when I've had teams in, in, in Ecuador, in, in, in so many places. And I've literally been on my knees and said, what have I gotten us into? Father, is, am I obeying you or is this some crazy stunt of mine? And then I've felt the Father's pleasure because he loves to pour his pleasure when we walk in faith, even when there's a crisis of faith for a moment and he comes alongside and encourages us and calls us to do things far beyond what we have ever asked or imagined. In 2003, we took a team of 12 into Iraq in the northern part where the Kurds are. They are a hated, hated people. Saddam Hussein had a genocide program against the Kurds. He dropped chemical bombs in 1988 on the town of Halabja, where 5,000 people dropped in a matter of minutes. And so when we came there, we moved in and began to live among the Kurds. We did it on a Latino budget. There were 12 of us. The rent was $1,200. That's a lot for a Latino budget. But there were 12 of us. That's $100 a piece. We could do that. And so we all lived in one house and it turned out to be marvelous. The Kurds would say, you are a big family. You are Kurdish. You are like us. We love you. Because they live in community. They, big families are so precious to them. And so as we were there for a time, I mean, we were dirt poor. We, our big budget, first one was a $60 investment in buying um, basketball jerseys for a woman's team. That was our great vision and our great amount of money. But as we were there, we, we met a captain of the army and he started hearing about our vision for a, a family center there. And he goes, Jeff, this sounds great. You know, the coalition is on its way out. They still have money. You need to propose something. This is the time for a proposal. And I said, well, how much time do we have? And he said, you have 72 hours and it closes. And I go, okay. <laughs> And luckily we had a great team. My daughter was on that team at that time. And we, were, we had architect friends in Chile. And so they're drawing up plans. And with a half an hour to spare, we turned it in. Several weeks later, the captain said, you guys had the best project. Here's $150,000. So this ragtag team that didn't have a dime all of a sudden had $150,000. Only problem was we had nowhere to build it. And so we began moving around. We met this wonderful Muslim man that had worked for the United Nations. He began working and he went from town to town until he found this one area, which is called Raparin, which is where Saddam Hussein, he would go out in villages and just collect people, bulldoze their towns, bring them closer to the city so he could control them and say, make a new life. And so the mayor loved this idea and gave us a piece of property worth $300,000. And 
And so when you walk in obedience, you begin to see things. And we began to reach out to these precious Kurdish children. They got to do art. They got to learn English. They got to experience a center where love was just an incredible, incredible experience. For many of the women, we were able to teach them how to do uh, uh, patterns for dresses, and then they learned to sew. They have been able to start their own businesses. They actually uh, make their own clothes for their family. Over a thousand women have graduated from this center. Living Word has been a part of this entire thing. They uh, They have helped us make many of these projects take place. Then ISIS came into Iraq. That is one of the most evilest groups I have ever seen in my life. The tragedies that have take place, taken place in that country are just heartbreaking. And the Yazidi people, which are a, a, a special people, the smallest religion in the world, they were on, most of them on a mount. I bet you some of you saw those escapes. The U.S. Army helped with helicopters it bring the children and, and people out. And they came into our city and we began to provide them with food. We began to provide them with, with kerosene. The, Northern Iraq is extremely cold in the winter. Look at some of these precious children. My my, my wife, who goes with me into this area, looks at some of these precious girls and they go, they look like my son Gabe's children. I mean, they look my, like my grandchildren. And my wife would just weep over that situation saying, these could have been our grandchildren. How can we not help these people? And so providing clothing, some of them are still in tents after four years, still in tents. Many of them live in half-finished buildings as well. And so we provide clothing, we provide food for these precious Yazidi people. Uh, Again, my son Gabriel, who just flew in from Indonesia, is is here. He uh, heard about this story from our team leaders, who are Chileans, the wife is, and, and she said she heard one of the Yazidi children asking the father, what did ISIS do with my bike? I mean, they lost everything. They lost their homes. But this little child worried about her bike. And so our youth in Chile did a giant fundraiser and purchased all these bikes for all these Yazidi kids. And it was just such a beautiful, beautiful experience to see smiles again. I mean, some of these children that we met did not utter one word for six months because of the trauma that they had experienced. And so now we were able to see this kind of joy. The craziest thing that has happened, because this would not have happened in 2003. Two years ago, I was invited to our center again. And I just made this mention because we have Muslim staff as well as Christian staff. I said, I'd love to do a marriage seminar here someday. And one of the Muslims said, can you do it before you leave? And I said, I'm leaving in two days. Well, can you? (laughs) Yes. And so I know the level of communication in Muslims' families. And, And so I said, I'm going to do the five languages of love. And that was a good start. It was like we have never heard some things as profound as this. Just the need is incredible there. And so he brought in 15 Muslim families and it was just an incredible thing. And so then I came back the, the next year and they had, they had 50 families and they said, come, we'll, we want to take you to the auditorium we, we rented. And I said, so how did you advertise this? Because it was empty and it was huge. They said, oh, we did some photocopies and stuck them on the building. And I went... It's going to be empty tomorrow. (laughs) And when I got there, it was packed. And I have now been in universities with 600 students. I have been on national television talking about marriage. And God has just opened incredible doors to be able to make such an incredible, incredible difference in this part. As a result, we believe in mobilizing Latinos. We believe they have certain advantages as well. And so this year we did this incredible, those of you who were here a few months ago, Oceans of Grace, those are my kids. They played in worship. They are doing an incredible job in Latin America, mobilizing and encouraging people to do something new and and step up to a a challenge. 
Gabriel spoke, my son, and he said, I challenge the Latino youth to make a difference. And he mentioned these four countries, 108 youth came forward from our church movement that are willing to move out and willing to make a difference. And now we're going to do the same thing in Ecuador and then in Peru. We want to mobilize 1,000 Latinos into the least reached people of the world. And we're so thrilled with being a partner with Living Word and what God is doing. And so grateful for a church that is passionate. I just want to thank you. I would like to pray over this precious church. Father God, Yahweh, I bless your name today. I thank you for the privilege of sharing with these precious, precious people. Thank you that they have a missional heart. But I pray today that you have touched individuals that need to take steps, that need to expand their comfort zone, that need to consider where you are calling them to be a servant for the least reached people in the world. And I pray that you'll open the windows of heaven with blessings, with shalom over this church, and may it be blessed for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.